All right, so today's content, oh, it's so exciting. We are automating Internet Explorer today. So we're using VBA to control Internet Explorer. I keep hoping that Microsoft is going to make this work for Edge you know, or something else. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Internet Explorer is the only one. So what we're going to see is how we can use VBA to like, remote control Internet Explorer and make it do our bidding. Question that comes up pretty frequently is, you know, what other browsers can I do this with? Can I do this with Chrome? Can I do it with Firefox? Can I do it with Safari or whatever? Uh, and the answer is you can do it with any browser that exposes its core functionality through the component object model. That's how we're able to control it. Is that they said, ah, oh, we're going to expose this through COM, component object model. Uh, and here's the list of browsers that do. Internet Explorer. That's it. That's the only one. Um, there's no reason that Chrome or Firefox couldn't, but they don't. Uh, and so this is kind of what we're limited to. Uh, are they going to expose the core functionality of, of uh, what's it called, Edge to the component object model? The longer we go without it happening, the, the less likely it is. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Today, for the first time, I went to a website and said, you're using Internet Explorer 11. Cut it out. It's an old browser. Microsoft's no longer updating it. So um, you might get three or four years out of this, and then you might have to move on to a different way to do this. But you'll get the idea of how to control a browser to interact with um, HTML. So we're down. This is not even an Excel workbook. Down. This is a .bas file. Let's go ahead and get that downloaded. And then we're going to start by working in a regular old blank workbook. File, new, blank workbook. And I'll open up my code editor. Let me insert a module. So here's the module I'm going to do my work in today. But that, that file you downloaded, that .bas file, what was it called? Explorer tools or something? IE tools or something? That's really a VBA module that's been exported out of Excel. It's just a text file. You can actually open it up and look at it as a text file. You can edit it as a text file. It's pretty simple. But we're just going to import that module here. So I'll choose file. Import file, <coughs> and then I will find where I downloaded it. Now the trouble is, I'm not sure where I downloaded it. Oh, I haven't saved it yet. Save as, I'll put it in my downloads. So there it is mod IE tools. Dot BAS stands for basic, short for visual basic. Okay. And so now here is the module. This is a module we just imported, mod IE tools. If I double click that, you know, we'll see there's a there's several, not a whole lot, but there's several procedures that are already written here, and, and they're just basically a set of procedures that makes your life easier working with Internet Explorer. And so we'll get exposed to most of them today in class. Um, but we'll leave that one aside for now. But we want to get that one imported. All right. So let's make a sub procedure called login. And what we're going to do is we're just going to log into your LDS.org account. So if I was to come, well, I'll do this. I'll do this. I'm going to come to, to a browser and I'm going to type in LDS.org slash directory. Try to get to my word directory and find out who the bishop is so I can go repent or something. Something we need to automate. So, that's right. <laughs> Gotta automate our home teaching. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I do that and it says, oh, slow down. You know, if you're going to get a directory, you got to be logged in. And so, you forgot that. Victory. LDS.org slash DIRC. That's all right. There we go. And so it's going to say, wait a minute, you need to log in first. It's like I already saved my credentials in Chrome. It's kind of bad. Someone sent it to my account. Find out who my home teacher is. Okay. So um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to say, oh, we just tried to go to the directory, but you're not logged in. We want the program to realize it's not logged in and to say, let's go ahead and log in automatically. Be able to fill out the information here, find that button here, and click on the button. So that's what we're about to do. Are we ready to do it? All right. So back to Excel. <clears throat> Step one is to add a reference. Ref. 
a reference to ooh, actually internet controls or something. C O N T R L S. So tools, references. It's like Microsoft Internet Controls. It has been since last time I taught this that I've been here. Uh, M. Microsoft. Ah, oh, there it is. Microsoft Internet Controls. That's right. So make sure you get the checkbox. Not enough to make it blue. You got to check it, and then that will give you access to the to the to the Internet Explorer object. So let's go ahead then. So here's the idea. It's an object. We can create an instance of the object. It has properties and methods that allow us to do various things with it. And so we're going to create an, an object variable, dim IE. We can say as object. Right? Remember, this is just, it's, I'm allocating just enough memory to hold a reference to an object. Or I can say Internet Explorer. The benefit if I say Internet Explorer, instead of just dimming it as an object, dimming it as in an explorer, then I get IntelliSense help while I'm working with it. And that's going to be a big deal because it's brand new to us. And there's a lot of methods and properties to be able to work with. Now let's set IE equal to a new Internet Explorer. What's the shortcut I could have done to avoid typing this line? Yeah, I could have just put the keyword new right here and that had the same effect. But I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave this as a separate line. We'll see why later. Give me a little benefit. That is going to create a new instance of Internet Explorer. But here's the problem: it's going to be invisible. What do you want Internet Explorer if it's invisible? I mean, why would you want an invisible Internet Explorer? Yeah, so I could control it through code and never even let the user know I was doing it. But while we're developing, we're going to need to see it. So, i.e., it's got a property called visible. We'll just set that equal to true. Okay, let's two, true. Let's put a breakpoint on the end sub and run it right to this point. That should give us. It shouldn't take too long. It's taking longer than it should. There we have Internet Explorer. There it is. It seems strange to see Internet Explorer when it's not trying to do something. I mean, there's no page loaded. There's no URL in here. It's just sitting here. But that's it. So far, so good? All right. Question. So, well, this edge replaces Internet Explorer. Is that yeah, so the question is, how about Edge? And the answer is, so far, Microsoft has not exposed the core functionality of Edge so that we can access it through VBA. I, I expect that they will, but it's been a long time, man. So yeah, if you don't have Internet Explorer, that seems so strange. If you don't have Internet Explorer, somebody did something on purpose to get rid of it. Because it, it should be there. Just, did you find it? Okay. So now we got to tell it to go somewhere. So IE dot navigate. Now there's a navigate and there's a navigate to. I don't really know the difference between these two. I just figured navigate to must be the newer one. We should use it. And I'm going to give it a URL to go to. Where I want it to go? HTTP colon slash slash lds.org slash directory. Okay, so I already have my Explorer open. You know, so here's where, this is one of the places that PBA is just a fabulous environment to work with. I can just drag my yellow indicator back to that line, hit F5 again, and it will invoke that, that part of the browser. It will run that statement. It will run the whole thing again. So, we've done the easy part. So far, we've gotten the browser open, we have taken it to a particular URL, and we're, we're kind of ready to go. Now, here's the thing, I want you to watch what happens. Let me go, I'm gonna go somewhere else. You don't have to do this, I just want you to watch. Let me go to google.com. I'm gonna come back here, 
and I'm going to run this line again, and you watch closely, and you tell me which one happens first. Does the page load, or do I get to the breakpoint? So does the yellow line get to the end sub, or does the page load first? You ready? Got to watch which one's going to happen first. You don't have to watch very hard. <laughs> which one happened first? Yeah, got to the end sub first. So what does that mean? What 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 troubling thing? What that should be troubling. Why is that troubling? That's right. If my next line of code here says put in the username and the password, that code's going to execute before the page is there. So as soon as I tell IE to navigate, it says, you want me to navigate? Great, I'm navigating. And, and VBA goes, I'm done. You, I did what you wanted me to do. I'm moving on. So we have to do something very specific to tell it, wait. You've got to wait until this page is loaded. And this is one of those things that if you look at several of the examples online, they're not very good. So I have written a procedure that will wait. Here's the, here's the problem. In the early days of the internet, we didn't have a whole lot of active content. Today, almost every page we go to, there's some kind of active content happening. The page is actually changing itself from what the server actually sent. You know how this works? You got a browser here. You ask the web server for a page. You say, all right, you give me a page. And in fact, if you look at this, what page did we ask this to go to? Can't quite see it. We asked this to go to directory. That's not where it is. It has redirected us. Just load this up. It's redirected us to somewhere totally different. Sometimes that happens during the server request. The browser says, give me a page. And the server goes, yeah, I'm not giving you that page. I'm giving you a different page. But most often, today, what happens is we send down that page, and then the browser goes, oh, yeah, you're not ready for this page. I'm going to give you a different page. And it makes a separate request. Or it, ch it actually has active content that changes itself from what was sent. It's got like a JavaScript program that runs once it gets to the browser. And the whole idea here is that you have millions and millions of people using the Internet. And so the more of the workload that we can pass down to the browser to do the work, the less work the server has to do. And so our pages end up being more responsive because I'm not, I'm not sharing this one resource with a million people. I'm doing just the bare minimum I can do to give you the information and then let your browser do the rest of the work to make it look pretty. So instead of making a very pretty page and sending it to you, I send you an ugly page with instructions on how to make it pretty, and I let your server do, and I let your browser do the rest of the work. So. The problem is, is that in the simple versions of telling the browser to wait, there's a couple of things we can look for. We can ask this browser if it's busy, and we can ask what its ready state is. Anyway, I probably don't want to go into the details. Um, it's over here in Mod IE Tools. The very first procedure here is called wait for. It's a sub procedure we call wait for. We pass it an Internet Explorer to actually wait on. We can have multiple copies of Internet Explorer open, we pass one of them down here, and it says, you know what, start off by waiting for a second, this says wait for a second. We're going to try to make sure that we're attached onto the right Internet Explorer, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, and then we check to make sure that we're not busy, and the ready state is for. It means we're, we're ready. And then we wait for another second, and we check to see if we're still in that condition. If so, it says, great, we're done waiting. Otherwise, it stays in the loop. So this is just going to sit here, and it's going to loop until, for at least a second, we have, we're, we're not busy, and the ready state is full. And those are just properties, those are just properties of the Internet Explorer. Um, maybe later I'll tell you why we want to look at it twice, but for now, just believe. It's Christmas after all. So it's just copy and paste? So we... Nope. So here's all we have to do. So, so that should be in already. So now all we have to do is we come here and we say, wait for, we call that procedure, and we pass it the object that we want it to, to. We look back here, we're passing in a variable. It's a, it's a parameter. And whatever we pass in, it's going to be waiting until that object is not busy, until that object's ready state is for. And so we have to give it an Internet Explorer to work on. And so that's what we do right here. Wait for ID. 
right? We declared IE as an Internet Explorer. We could have another one called IE2. We could have one called Fred. We could have one called Santa. We could have three or four different browsers open at once. We could say, we're doing something on this browser, wait for that one to be done. We're doing something on this browser, wait for that one to be done, and so forth. Um, how does this affect tabs in the browser? Oh, the question is, what about tabs? And the answer is, this is all going to work on whatever tab is active. The active tab is the one that we're looking at. You know what? I have never even tried to think about doing it on some tab besides the besides the active tab. I'm not sure. Well, like if you tell a tab to do something and then create a new tab, you then have one tab that's loading and a new tab that you could sort of use. Right. Well, that, that's something that you might have to play with. That's going to be beyond what we're doing today, and in fact, beyond what we're doing in this course. Okay. Okay. So now let's do that. We'll do that same exercise again. And let's go back to Google, or there's Google. And now we'll do that same thing. We're going to watch to see. No one's Chrome. Oh, that's Chrome. Thank you very much. That's what you were saying. That's Chrome. Okay, so now let's we'll execute that. The page is here, and then. We got to the next line. So that's just going to tell us, wait until that page is settled down with downloading and rendering itself. Okay, so now the trick is we got to find this thing right here. Oh, this is so much easier than it used to be. Now we can right click and say inspect element. So go ahead and do that right click and say inspect element, and that will now bring up another window that will show us. Oops, Will show us some details. Is that missing? Oh, there's got to be a way to separate this into a different window. I just don't know how to do it. Anyway, let's take a look at it here. So here, this is the tag that we clicked on. Oh, does anybody know how to separate this into a different window? Well, mine shows up on the bottom. Looks like F12 closed it and opens it. That'll be good for us. Okay. Thank you. All right. So you go ahead and close that again. I'm going to right click this and choose Inspect Element. And that's going to show me, it's going to highlight this one. That's the tag. This is the HTML source code that makes that input box. In fact, it's the tag, the kind of tag is it's an input. Do we see it here? Is this an input tag? It starts with this opening bracket, this less than sign, we call it an angle bracket, input, and then it ends right here with this slash closing angle bracket. So that's the tab. The good news is it has an ID. If it has a name or it has an ID, it's going to be easy to get to. If it has an ID, it's going to be the easiest to get to. So the ID, the identifier for this tag is ID token one. So here's how I can refer to that through my code. I can now say IE dot document. So this is the document that's being rendered in the browser right now. Dot all. There's a collection. Just the same way that we use collections in VBA, there's a collection built into this, into the document. So all is all of the tags. Watch this. I'm going to say, go ahead and show me IE dot, uh, dot document dot all. Dot. Now you'll want it in your mind. You want to say count. That's just that's turns out that's not the way you ask for the length of a of this particular collection. Instead, we say length. It's something there are 112 tags on the page. Typically in VBA, a collection is one based. This one happens to be zero based. It's not VBA. We're working with a different you know objects that were created in a different environment. And so there are 112 there are 112 tags. On this page, I can ask for one of those in particular, i.e., dot document, dot all. I could say, I wonder what number 50 is. That will get me to the tag. I need a property of it. I'm going to take the outer VBR HTML. That's going to print the outer HTML of that particular tag. Here it is. It's a line item, class, language item, on click, select language. It's something dealing with selecting the language to view the site as. That's what number 50 is. You want to see what number 49 is? Symbol. 
Sorry, it's some of them. But it's a different tag. So I can, I can ask for these tags by number. But if they have an ID, I can ask for them by ID. And so what was the ID? It was like ID token one. So instead of asking for 49, I can put here ID, ID, uh, I think case matters, ID token one. And there it is. It's an it, the input tag. That's it. I have access to that tag in the document right now while this browser is going. And so I can use that to modify a property. Go back to my code. So ID document all ID token one dot value equals, and then my username at lds.org. It's one of the benefits of having a strange first name. You can sometimes get it as your username. So now, uh, let's see. F12. So watch what happens. This is like magic. I'm going to run just this line and watch what happens to the, the username. It, it just modifies that page and puts the username right in. That's like kind of exciting because once you realize you can do that, you can do anything. I happen to know the next one is token 2. I'll put in my password. Or I'll, Wait, put in, or I'll put in not my real password. Ooh. And then, of course, that will go in as well. Now all I have to do is click on this button. There's actually two things I can do. One, the way that an HTML form works, when I have data that I'm going to send off to a server from a, from a web page, it's included in what's called a form. And so if I can find the form, depending on how the page is set up, sometimes I can just say, well, give it to the form and then submit as a submit method, submit the form. That works sometimes. And sometimes it's easier because sometimes the form has an ID, but the button doesn't. And if you've got an ID, that's the easy way to go. But the more general, per the more general approach is to find, find the button and then just click it. It has a click method called the click method. I'm getting so excited, my head started to sweat. Taking the hat off. <sighs> I feel better already. So we got we got to find out how to refer to this. So I'm going to right click this and choose inspect element. Earlier today, when I was looking at this one, for some reason I couldn't inspect it. Is that the case here? I, yeah, it's, it didn't take me to that one. I'm not sure why it didn't take me to that one. So I'm going to have to look around a little bit more to find it. So here's token one. What's this one? That's not it. I don't know. I'm just going to open up some of these other ones. There's token two. Forgot your password. That's the next one. Spam, clone, something. I don't know what that is. Some div. Legal viewer. No, that's not, probably not it. What's the next one? Content two. Where is it? Did you find it? Are you seeing content wrapper up here? ID button hidden center. It's underneath, it's, it's, yeah, it's underneath center content. So here we go, centered content. Oh, it's, it's not underneath that one. Let's scroll down. Yeah, it's not underneath that one. I wonder if I can do a search on this. Control, control F work here. Yeah, it's F. Oh, there's content wrapper. They go higher for higher than where I am? Yeah, so higher up. Still higher? Yeah. Well, it's not above token one. It's not above this one. I think it is. You think it is? Yeah. Higher? So you just scroll up. There we go. Constant wrapper. You can see oh there you got it. So constant wrapper next is clone component. So here's the form. This form doesn't have an ID. It might be nice to be able to get to it. Okay, so am I going to the right place? We've content two, you say. So Centered content. Then I need to go send. 
field set submit button. That looks promising. Yeah, there it is. Interesting. ID login, submit content. Anyway, we've got to find that. Why the inspector won't let us find it directly, I'm not sure. I've never seen that before. But here we go. So if we can find the form login, and on the next level there's one called content2. Even if you can't find it, all we need to do is we need to find what the ID was. And here's the ID. Login dash submit dash button. So I'm going to copy this line. <coughs> I'm going to get the identify it by its ID. Login dash submit dash button. Now. I'm not trying to change the value. I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to click it. There's a click method called click. That's what I want to. You know, see, it says sign in. We can change the label that's actually showing on the button. There's no reason to do that. We just want to click it. So that should do well. Now, here's the thing. When I click, that's going to tell us. Send some information back to the server. The server's going to check my username and password and go, are you, are you who I think you are? <laughs> yes. We're going to send you on to where you're supposed to go. What do I have to do while that's happening? i got to wait. And so i got to tell it to wait for and pass it that Internet Explorer object to wait. So now I'm going to come back to all of these. Just for kicks, since I'm going back to the top of those, I'll delete those out. I'll run this, and again, we should see it. Fill those values in. It will click this. We won't really see it click, but we'll see it now start to navigate to a new location. It'll be waiting until that page is loaded, and then it should stop at the end sub. And of course, since I'm not, since I'm not putting my real password, it's not going to come back and, and show me the directory. It's going to come back and say, there's some problem with your username or password. We're waiting. We haven't gotten to this breakpoint yet. We're waiting for that page to load. Still trying to figure out. It can be authenticated. Waiting. Have any of you actually gotten authenticated yet? Yes. Apparently, it's easier to authenticate than to not authenticate. Maybe it's looking really hard. It's really working on my behalf to figure out how to get it. But anyway, you can see that it has actually, you know, we, we have successfully put those values in, clicked on that button. That's that's the big I can't securely connect. Might be because of an outdated or unsafe something. Yeah, this is not what I was expecting. Navigated to HTTP instead of HTTPS. Oh, you are right. You are so right. I'm going to change this to HTTPS, and that will tell it to use a secure socket layer for the communication. Um, and actually, we should be able to run it again from there. It should just go. We're still connected onto that browser. Hopefully. Wait for LDS.org. Don't really need to wait so long for this. Okay, so that's what it takes. I didn't quite get through, but we know the code works from other students in class that have Questions? Yes. So are you going to supply us with the wait for? Like when we do an assignment? No. I have supplied you with the wait for method already. You got it. So but the question is, are you going to give us the wait for method? And and the answer is, I've, I've already done that. So let's post it right out here, right? Mod IE tools. Just import that anytime you want to use these tools. And at some point, you know, once you've done this, you're not really going to get that comfortable with this until you've done a couple of projects on your own. You know, you might go, hmm, I need this to behave a little bit differently than the way Dr. Allen has made it. You'll dig in and understand the code. It's not, the code's not too bad. In fact, of all the code that's happening here, it's not too bad. It's a lot, it's a lot to bite off on your first day. But once you've got some road in your feet, none of the code in those tools is, is all that good. Could you show us one more time how you imported that into your... Yeah, the question is, how do we import that module? And that's right here. You just say, if you're in your Visual Basic Editor, you say, file, import file. Okay. Uh, you can export a file. You want to export this module, right click, export file. And that just, it just, I mean, the module is just a bunch of text. It just makes a text file with it and puts it out there. Yes? How do you keep your password secure? Ah, 
How do you keep my password secure? The first way I keep my password secure is by not putting it on the video. <laughs> but what, what you're saying here is, well, what if we actually wanted to do this? This isn't a very secure thing to do to put my password in the code. It's a good question. There's a couple of, a couple of ways that we can do it. Number one is we could prompt the user to type in their password. So we could put up a user form, and that user form could have you know, a text box. There's actually a password character. Can we do it? Can we do something with a password character? Anyway, um, I won't show it to you right now, but there's actually a property on a text box called password character. You put an asterisk in there, whatever user types in it echoes an asterisk across the time. So that's one way. The second way to do it is that you can actually write your file, your username out to a, or your password, whatever, out to a text file, which you just keep on the, on the hard disk, and then you can use various approaches to encrypt it. That's not really much safer than, than doing this but it would require a little more work for the casual observer to be able to find out what that file, what that password is. Um, the, uh, the safest way is to have them type it in. Even better is to never even handle the password. Let's take a look at how we might do that. Let me, let's go ahead, that's a good question. Let me change this to uh, login to. I'm gonna copy, I'm running, why am I running? Stop running. I'm gonna change this to uh, copy it and change it to login to. So, what we're saying is, hey, this, putting your password in the code, not too safe. So another approach is to here, well, let's just go ahead and open up the Internet Explorer, let's get right to the page, and then let's just let the user type it in. So in that case, what we'd want to do is we would want to, we would want to look for something, we want to kind of continue to look at the page until we got somewhere we were trying to get to. Now it turns out we can ask, boy, let's go ahead and run this. Let me run this, I'm gonna run this right up to right up to here. So instead of typing in, we're gonna let the user do us gonna call this login too. Instead of typing in, we're gonna let the instead of hard coding it, we're gonna let the user type it in. So I put a breakpoint right when we're getting ready to put the code in. I'm there at my breakpoint now. Here's what I'm going to do. I am going to first see that we can ask for the location of the document. So we can say ie.document.location. And that will give us the URL where we are. Now, I know that I tried to tell it to go here. But it's not going to take me there. It's going to take me to this other place. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to, here on wait for load, I'm going to start a do loop. Do and loop. Right around wait for load. And I'm going to loop until I'm going to loop until the Internet Explorer's location is equal to what I'm expecting it to go to. Now, I think it might actually put a language on the end, does it? When you when you log in, I guess I can check it again. When you go to ns.org slash directory, take me to log in. Oh, no, good. So it actually takes me to that. It does append a slash onto it. And so I'll want to check for that. But I want to I want to be here in this loop. I've just told it to go to the directory. Maybe I'll put the slash on it here so it's parallel. And I'm going to tell it wait until until that's the location. What is, what has to happen for this to be the location that it's actually at? The user will have to log in. So here's this interesting thing. I'm going to go ahead and drag up at the beginning of this do. And now I'm waiting for load. I'm saying, you know, wait a couple seconds. We're checking to see if we're done loaded. Yeah, we're done loaded. And it says we're going to do this until the location is the directory. Am I there yet? Well, no. Where am I? I'm right here. I'm on SSO. And so it's waiting for the load. It's 
saying, are we there yet? Nope. And it comes back and it waits for the load. Are we there yet? Nope. It waits for the load. Are we there yet? It waits for the load. Are we there yet? And so, when I come in here and put my credentials, this is my real test. No, that's the Trying to log in. It's logging in. Now that's the directory. Watch this. And now we're out of that loop. So that's probably the most secure way to handle the credentials, is to say, I'm going to let the user log in, and once they get logged in, we'll go and do what we need to do. Um, but sometimes, I mean, the great thing about the computer is that it's like more than happy to do this in the middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning. Log on to ksl.com and see if someone's posted a, you know, an ad for the car that you just are dying to buy. Um, and so maybe sometimes when you do want to be able to have it type in your username and password. Okay, other questions? William. Uh, does this work for like, through VPN or like secure sites? Does it work for VPN or secure sites? The answer is yes. Anything that you could do just with the browser, you can do by controlling the browser. Because as far as the whole rest of the system is concerned, there's some guy sitting behind Internet Explorer doing this. It just happens that that guy is VBA. Okay, let's move on to another example. I've given you a link in Learning Suite. Where's Learning Suite? Uh, it's the colonialbakehouse.com slash Chicago slash inspection. The Colonial Bakehouse is a URL I bought years ago and kind of maintained for whatever reason, I'm not sure, uh, until I make examples that I kind of have to keep it around. So what this should do is it should give us the ability to search for information about food, food, food establishment inspection violations in the city of Chicago prior to the year 2016 or something. That's like when I did this example. So this is real data. I can come in here and say, you know what? I'm interested in any violation that contains the term rat. <laughs> uh, rodent. Submit. Uh, and this will then, this will bring back real data uh, about this. Uh, no pest control contract available at this time. Must provide, uh, so what does it say rodent? Oh, here it is. It actually says rodent in the name of the violation. So here's the 6-5 Chinese restaurant, 201 West Madison Street, Chicago. And when did they, so there was an inspection on um, January 21st, 2016. They failed their inspection. Why did they fail? They had one problem. What was the problem? Yeah, they didn't have a contract available. We want to see your pest control contract. Oh, you know, we can't find it. You failed. Did they, did they see any rats? No indication of that. But that's a serious violation. So they failed their inspection. Anyway, so that's what this is. It's kind of nice because it's real data, but here's the thing, is that we've got to go in here and type in, we've got to put values in here. So imagine, uh, so it turns out the city of Chicago just makes this data public. Like every, I'm not sure how often, like once a week, it pushes all their inspection data out for public consumption. That's where I got the data. Uh, but it's just available on our website. And so what one of the companies did in Chicago shortly after they, they started, it was a pest control company, is that they just, every time the data was published, they did it by hand, by the way, but they just went through and they checked to see, all right, who got a violation for so they dealing with rodents? They are desperately in need of pest control. They're the people we want to talk to. And so, um, was that a good business model? Absolutely. Hey, you know what? I noticed you failed your inspection because you got a pest control problem. I'm a little more expensive than the next guy, but I can make it happen today. What are you going to do? Come on over. We're failed right now. So, um, interesting thing. So what we'd like to do is kind of the same thing. Put in rodent, click submit, and then go and get this data. And we'll see a couple of the other tools along the way to do it. You ready? I'm going to stop the code that we have here. And we'll make a new sub procedure. Sub get rat data. DMIE as an Internet Explorer. 
Now, here's the thing. One thing you find out is that if you're all the time creating Internet Explorers, each time you run this, a new Internet Explorer pops up, you're going to end up with a bunch of Internet Explorers open. I've got two. It's easy to get 20 or 30. Um, oh, by the way, how, do, how can we close those? Might be good to put that example here and log in. Wait for IE, IE.quick. That's, that's how you terminate that, that Internet Explorer object. That will unload it out of memory and, and close it. But even if you're doing that, your code hangs and you end up with multiple, multiple ones. So it might be nice just to say, you know what? If, it, if there is an Internet Explorer on the road, but just hook up to it. I just want to use the one that's there. And so that is, there's a, I've created something called attach. And again, that's in the mod ID tools. Here's how it works. Uh, attach. And then you give, it, you give it an object variable to attach to the most recently opened Internet Explorer object. If you want to limit it to an Internet Explorer object with a particular URL, you can specify all or part of the URL, and it will say, oh, I found an Internet Explorer object. Does it have that URL? Nope. Oh, here's another Internet Explorer object. Does it have that URL? Oh, yeah, that's the one. It'll hook up to that. But if you don't specify any URL, we'll just connect on to the most recently opened Internet Explorer object. Now, it's, you'll notice that this is a function. It's a Boolean. It returns true or false. What do you suppose it means if it returns false? For some reason, it wasn't able to connect up. So let's do this. Let's say if attach IE, and now we're using it like a function, so we have to put parentheses around the argument list. In fact, let's say if not, if we didn't attach to an IE, what do we need to do? Set IE equal to a new Internet Explorer. And then IE.visible, IE. Visible equals true. So we're going to try to attach onto an existing Internet Explorer object. If that works, great. If it doesn't, open up a new one, make it visible, and we're ready to move on. All right, so now let's go to the URL, which is just Chicago Inspection, colonialbakehouse.com slash Chicago slash inspection, i.e. dot Navigate to wait for IE. And I'll put a breakpoint on my end sub and I'll run it to that point. So right now I've got two Internet Explorer open windows open. It should attach onto one of those. And Let's do it. Um, it's not supposed to attach on the Chrome. Why did it give you the wrong version of Internet Explorer for this? Stand by. Let me figure it out. You Project Explorer. Try something that one you try for the next one. Oh, no, it did. I just went to the wrong one. It's attached. I just went, I went to Chrome. It found here this, this uh, IE thing. So here it is, beautiful picture of some kitchen. That's a kitchen I'd like to eat at. I'm going to tell you, most of the kitchens in Chicago don't look anything like this. <laughs> okay, so, so that's nice. Um, and in fact, if we close all of our Internet Explorer windows, it would still open one up, make it visible, and take us there, and we'd be in great shape. All right, so now let's go through the same process here. What's the, we want to look for where the violation contains what we do where the violation contains crabs. So I'm going to inspect this element. I've got to find out what the object is we're after. It's an input. ID is violation text. So same thing, ie.document.all. We're looking for one called violation text. Violation underscore text. Dot value equals crab. We could go through and find other things. Uh, we're looking for particular date range. We're looking for the name contains. You know, only looking at you know, high risk item. Maybe we'll, we will do this one. Let's see how it goes. But now we're ready to submit. So let me inspect that one. Uh, Really? Same thing? 
that's still looking at the violation text. You exit the browser and then reopen it and it takes you there? It's just taking me right back to the same one that I was on. I just need to figure out how to actually exit out of the of the tools. Anyway, it's probably not going to be too hard to find. It's after the table. There it is. Button ID. It's just called the ID is search. So set that to crab. Find the one called search. And click it. Wait for load. And that should get us to that one. Let's go to Chrome. Yeah, hold on a second. Just make sure that we're here. So let's just say crab here somewhere. Crab cakes, breadcrumbs, and so forth. Crab cakes need to be at 46 degrees, or shouldn't be at 46 degrees. So yeah, we're in good shape. Here's the code. So the next part is, so now you've seen how to refer to the Internet Explorer object, manipulate it, tell it to do our bidding, but still, we got to get the data out of that page and bring it back to, to Excel. Because really, that's one of the things we're interested in. Go to a particular location, get the information that we need, and bring that data back to Excel. There's a couple ways to do it. One way is, if you remember back at the very beginning of class, we dealt with a web query. Um, the thing about the web query is it's not so easy to be able to do a, a, a login with the web query. But here, doing a login is not too bad. Get to the page, find, put in the information, submit, we're logged in. Trouble is, our web query tools can't just hook up to an existing Internet Explorer and pull the data in. But they can look at a local file. And so one of the tools I've given you is called import. And all it does is it takes the data that you currently have showing in your Internet Explorer, it saves it to a local file, it points the web query tool at that local file, and it imports it. So this is really kind of slick. Let's take a look how it works. You can see the details. Looking at the details of this code is not too bad. You can look it up. But let me just show you how to use it. I.e., you know, it's uh, import. Import page, I think. Import page, yeah. Give it an index score to work with. And then you give it a sheet name to create or replace. I'll just call it data. That's the one thing that's a little bit dangerous about this is that whatever sheet name you give it, it is going to create a new sheet with that name. If there's already a sheet with that name, what's going to happen? It's going to blow it away. There's not going to error. We don't want errors. So I said, you know what? If there's a sheet by that name, gone. Is it going to prompt you? You don't get some data. You're no. Gone. So be careful with this. It'll make a new sheet and it will bring in the data from that page. And so... We go back to that place, run that. <gasps> oh, very important that you have saved your workbook because it needs to know where the workbook is to save the file. So let's debug this. Actually, let's stop this. And I'm going to save. I could have saved it without stopping it. I'll save this in my documents. Make sure it is an XLSM. And I will call it control IE all of seven. Now I will try that again. So get wrap data. Oh, I should probably get crab data since we're after crabs, right? Carb data? Probably what I should have. Get some carb data. It's going to attach on to that. It's going to navigate there. It's going to put in the crabs. It's going to click the search, wait for it to come back, and then import the data. 
So now I'll come to my Excel file. I now have a sheet called data. And here's that information right from that page brought in. And so now it would be up to me to kind of work through the data that's currently viewing page 101. So there's not a whole lot of data for this. Um, but at least I've got data here. It's not in a very good format. I might have to work through this and do some string parsing to get this figured out. So that's kind of the first and easy way. Just import the page. It brings the data in. It is limited to data that you can see on the page. Is there stuff you might be interested in that's not on the page that you, that you can't see? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we might need to go and... Oh, was it one or two? This one? No. If it yeah. is one or two. So I might, I might really want to come down here and... Oh, this is currently viewing the page. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Come back. Right, so I could, I might want to be able to manipulate this. So why don't we go ahead and change it back to rodent and well, I guess we don't, we don't really need to see that. How would we do, you tell me, how would we do that? All right, we can find out what this object is, we can change its value, we can click on the submit button, we can wait. So we can navigate through this particular set. Um, but now, we, it, we, one of the things that might be important, and I don't think it's the case on anything here, is that sometimes what you have here is you have a link. And the information that you want is not displayed, but it is in the link. It's in the URL. And the Web Query Wizard is not going to bring in anything about the URL. It's what's displayed. So let's see how we can go through, kind of iterate through the elements on this page just by directly working with the page. So let's say that we just wanted to find, we just want to find the names of the companies that we're after. That'd be a good place to start. So let me take a look at this one. I'll inspect this. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. It's okay. The inspect should be okay. So it's, it's an H3. It's a level three heading that has the name. And then right below it is where the address is. You have the name and the address. But anyway, this should this should be okay. So what I want to do is I want to I want to look through all of the level three headings on the page, all the H3. There's a way to do that. Okay, so import data is one of the way import page is one of the ways to get the data. Another way to do it is by looking for particular tags. So let me dim uh, tag no as long integer. All right. Tag no equals, and there's a, another procedure in your IE tools called get tag number. I give it an Internet Explorer to work with, and then I give it a tag name to work with. What tag name am I after? I'm after a level three heading, so H3. Now, I might be interested, not in every H3, but H3 tags that have a particular characteristic. Let me see if maybe there's a better one than the H3 to look at for this. Um, let's see what this one is. That's not helping. All right, let's go with H3. That should return for me the very first, the tag number of the very first level three heading. So I've run that, run this line, and I'm now going to ask what the tag number is. So the very first level three heading tag is tag number 176. I could actually ask for it. Let's go ahead and do that. Just do a debug.print of IE dot all. What do I put here to get to that tag number? Remember, it's a collection. I'm sorry, it's IE dot document dot all. I can put either the name, the ID of the tag, or I can put the number. I've just found out the tag number of the first level three heading, and I will ask for the outer HTML. Outer 
changed. Outer HTML. The first tag is Chicago Q. Is that a Oh, that's the name of the business. Chicago Q is the name of the restaurant. Okay, now, if I don't want the outer HTML, I just want what's inside the tags. Outer HTML is saying, take that tag, everything from the beginning to the end of that tab. There's a very nice one called inner HTML, which is just everything besides the tags. And so if I do a debug document of the inner HTML, it should just pull off the name of the restaurant. Now, <clears throat> as it turns out, my get tag number uh, let's do this. I'll make, I'll make a loop of this. Do until tag no equals negative one. Get tag number returns a negative one when it can't find the tag you're specifying. Inside my loop, I'm going to print that, and I'm going to get the next tag number. It turns out that the next argument in get tag number is some characteristic about the tag I'm looking for. It's some identifying text. So if I'm only looking for H3 tags that somewhere in their text say Chicago, I can specify that here. But I want all of my H3 tags. So I'll skip that one. But then I have a start at tag number. So here I can say tag number plus one. So the first time I'm just getting the very first tag number. I'm getting the very first one. I'm not telling you where to start. It'll start at zero. Now I'm saying print off what I found there. And now go to find the next tag. That's an H3 tag. But don't start at the beginning. Start at one past the one we just found. And so this should print off the rest of the level three headings. And so there they are. It looks like we've got Chicago Q, China City, and Chinese Kitchen are the ones that had violations involving the word crap. So this is kind of the other way to get at the data. To just say, you know, I've got tags to work with. Let me kind of work through. If I want the next, if I want a tag that's it's two away from that. I don't have to print the tag number. I can print tag number plus one. Uh, what's that going to get me? I don't know. Whatever the next tag is after that. And so that's actually getting me the addresses. Let's bring the VR. I'm not sure. That's bringing me the address. So I can do offsetting with these tag numbers. Why are you doing the tag is negative one? Okay, so why tag negative one? And the answer is get tag number when it can no longer find the tag. When you say find me a tag with this characteristic starting at this location, if it can't find one, it sends back negative one. That's how it tells you it couldn't find it. That's a lot to bite off in one day. But those are the, the, the basic tools you need to be able to automate Internet Explorer, log into password protected websites. Navigate around, get data. Questions? Yeah. What about the websites that prompt for security? That's just not that. Oh, no. Prompt for security question? Well, you can find the security question. Yeah, you can just look for it. What's the security question? If you know these four security questions, it's got to be one of these, and you find what it is. Oh, I know the answer to that one. Your code knows the answer to that one. It puts it in. A little, more, a little more involved, but what we've done here is enough to learn how to do it. Probably couldn't do CAPTCHA, though. Uh, yeah. The whole purpose for a CAPTCHA is, is they're saying, we don't want you to do automated interaction with our site. Um, would it, is it possible to kind of use automation to kind of help get past that? You probably still need a human somewhere, but you could like say, you know what, get the CAPTCHA, send it to someone, have them type it in, have your code get it and put it back. But the whole point is they're saying don't. And so, yeah, I, I, this class is not showing you how to bypass that. It's, it's showing you how to automate it when it's necessary. Anything else?
Class dismissed. <laughs>